Podcast. Before we begin our discussion of the Fountainhead, in the name of full disclosure, I'm not a fan of Andran's philosophy. My worldview is informed by more of a traditional American lived experience libertarianism. I'm uncomfortable with absolutes of any type. I disagree with Rand's hostility towards faith. Reason can, with an emphasis on the word can, directly lead you to faith. Some of the most rational thinkers in human history had profound faith as a direct result of their reason. The two are not mutually exclusive ideas. You say you're a fan of Rand's philosophy? Okay, no skin off my nose. I spent more than one pleasant evening over a nice meal, good adult beverage, debating the merits of Rand's ideas with friends. I could be persuaded. No one's done it yet, but I could be persuaded. If I'm not a fan of Rand's philosophy, why am I making a video about the fountainhead? And as you're going to see here in a little bit, I'm going to talk glowingly about the ideas represented within. It all goes to what my grandmother used to always tell me. Always listen to a man's, or in this case, woman's, argument before you condemn it. You can completely disagree with somebody's philosophy, their body of work as a whole, but yet find things that they have said that you profoundly agree with. Growing up, I knew about Rand, read some of her stuff in high school, but it wasn't until I went to architecture school that I came into contact with the fountainhead. <laughs> In architecture school, you better know the fountainhead. Your only options, book or movie. Ideally, both. I prefer the movie. In my opinion, it's one of the few examples of a movie being better than the book. And this Gary Cooper. You gotta love Gary Cooper. Well, I love Gary Cooper. You guys, whatever. I want to start by debunking some architectural myths surrounding the movie and some of the architectural myths that the movie itself promotes. The movie presents that architecture only has two building styles, neoclassicism and modernism, and they were duking it out for supremacy. <laughs> nope. Neoclassicism and modernism are diametrically opposed ways of thinking, but there's quite a bit of time between the height of neoclassicism and when modernism became dominant right around 50 years. There were a whole slew of movements, craftsman style, art nouveau, art deco, just to name three. The movie claims the architectural profession, the intelligentsia, social elites, trendsetters, tastemakers fought tooth and nail to prevent the American public from accepting the genius that was modernism. <laughs> It was the exact opposite. Modernism was invented in academia. European architectural profession embraced, loved modernism. Here in America, it was the social elites, the trendsetters and tastemakers who brought modernism over from Europe and desperately tried to convince the American people to accept modernism. The American architectural profession they were more than happy to adopt the language, the style of modernism, but they never adopted the philosophy, the ideology of modernism. Modernism has never been popular with the American people. They saw through it. They figured out what was going on from day one. What did the American public see through? Well, that gets to one of the biggest myths the movie perpetuates. Supposedly, all these institutions are lined up in opposition to modernism because it's an unrestrained celebration of individualism. <laughs> modernism comes straight from Marxist art theory. Y'all remember how I said modernism was diametrically opposed to neoclassicism? Modernism said, reject the past, get rid of it, Kill it if you have to. Its goal was to create a new architectural aesthetic for a modern audience. Oh, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. Where have I heard that before? Past is prologue. This gets to one of the bigger problems with the movie. Howard Rourke, who represents the ultimate individualist, would never work in an architectural style that came out of Marxist art theory, in a style that subjugates the individual to the will of the group. 
The movie tries to take Howard Rourke, architect, iconoclast, the ultimate individualist, fighting to maintain his artistic integrity no matter the cost, and they turn him into nothing more than a salesman for modernism, an architectural philosophy meant to promote communist ideology. <laughs> yeah, somebody doesn't understand architecture or something a little more nefarious is going on here. But this gets to a deeper problem. Howard Rourke would have never worked in any established architectural style. He would have developed his own style. So why not show Rourke having his own style? If you know architectural history, there is a long tradition, especially here in America, of architects who go against the grain, develop their own style, develop new ideas that at first meet resistance, but later revolutionize the profession. At the time the movie was being made, there were several living examples to draw upon. This gets to the conundrum of the movie, why it sends such mixed messages. Howard Rourke may not be an unattainable ideal. Holding on to your convictions may be easier than the movie wants you to believe. This gets to why the Fountainhead is so popular in architectural circles. It actually lays out a pretty good roadmap on how to hold on to your ideals and be successful. The foundation of holding on to your integrity starts with rule one. You have to value the doing of architecture. Your largest reward must be the work itself. What you value matters. Fame, wealth, influence, social status, nothing wrong with those in of themselves. But if those are what you value, architecture just becomes a means to an end. It's all about compromise. Compromise is not an evil concept. We all have to compromise every single day. What matters is what we're willing to compromise on. Now that reveals who we are as a person and what we value. In my youth, I had a bit of a reputation, earned, mind you, for being unyielding, unwilling to bend my neck. For a few years after my parents' divorce, I walked a razor's edge. I could have gone down a very dark path really easily. But fortunately, another family took me in. Patty and Pete became my second parents. Not long before I headed off to college, I was hanging out with Pete, and he started telling me a story about the decision he made that changed the course of his life. I'd heard this story before, but this time it seemed like he was trying to tell me something, so I was really paying attention. When Pete finished his story, he turned to me and said, I'm going to tell you the two secrets to being successful in this world. First, compromise. The system demands you compromise. It will not accept you unless you're willing to compromise. If you compromise, you will succeed. Sounds pessimistic, fatalistic even. Pete's advice seems to fly in the face of the fountainhead. The story that Pete told me that day, he refused to compromise. Cost him dearly. He paid a massive price. But there's the second secret the all-important secret that Pete passed on to me that day. Never compromise who you are. And then he phrased it in a way that has always stuck with me. Never give up what makes Randy, Randy. He said, the world is a better place with Randy. Don't you be the one who destroys him. If your priority is wealth, fame, social position, influence, You'll easily compromise the architecture, as I said earlier, means to an end. On the other hand, if your priority is the doing of the architecture, your primary reward is the work itself, you'll sacrifice wealth, fame, influence, social position. Those things will be nice to have, but if you don't get them, who cares? Once you start to develop this mindset, you realize People who are opposed to you are irrelevant. There's an important scene in the movie. The main villain, the architectural critic, he confronts Rourke and he tells him, I'm the reason you can't get a job in this town. I'm the reason why the profession has rejected you. I'm the reason why the public hates you. I am blocking you at every turn. But I got to know, what do you really think of me? And Rourke's reply 
I don't think of you at all. If somebody is trying to take something from you that you place no value on, they have no leverage over you. They can't harm you. They are irrelevant to you in your world. How do you get to this mindset to where everything outside of what you value becomes irrelevant? Belief in self. It is this strong belief in self where architects get their reputation for arrogance. Now, there are two ways to get to this strong belief in self. One of them is through arrogance, not good. But the other path, ironically, is through humility. To know thyself, you have to question everything about yourself, who you are, what you are, what you value, and why you value those things. Once you become comfortable with who you are and what you value, you become much more tolerant of others and what they value. At one point, Rourke says, I didn't look for them. They found me. And any type of man that looks for me is my type of man. Psychology tells us this is very much the case. Strong, self-confident people who know themselves, know their values, and are willing to stand up for those values no matter what, those are appealing people. Others will gravitate towards them. Like attracts like. More often than not, they're going to be our type of people. It's always at this point in the conversation, some wiseacre will speak up and say, this is all theoretical BS. Sounds good on paper. It doesn't happen in the real world. My reply, (laughs) sucks to be you, because unfortunately, you're talking to the wrong guy. You want real world examples? Let's talk some real world examples. Pete's advice always stuck with me. When I headed off to college, I learned to compromise. I learned how to pick my battles. I learned what hills to die on and when it was best just to quietly move along. Even though I learned to compromise, I never forgot Pete's second secret. Never compromise your core values. Never give up what makes Randy, Randy. You might destroy me, but I ain't going to make it easy on you by doing your work for you. My first day in the PhD program, my very first official meeting with faculty, me and the other first-year students, we're told we have some formalities, some procedures, just some things you need to sign. What they were asking all of us to do was unethical. Yeah, it was a little thing, but it was still unethical. What got my attention, though, was their attitude. They were upfront about it. Yeah, this isn't really the way you're supposed to do it. Technically, you can get in trouble for doing it this way, but we've always done it this way. All of us did this on our first day here. Just do it. It's only going to take a second, so just do it. It'll be fine. And then they handed me the pen. I was the one that's supposed to go first, and I said, no. Awkward. They offered the pen to the next person, who also said no. All the first-year students said no. That's the moment I realized the game I was now playing. They weren't going to offer me a deal with the devil, sell my soul for my wildest dreams. They were going to try to get me to give up what makes Randy Randy one nibble at a time, one little compromise at a time. In hindsight, that was the moment I should have gotten up and ran as far away from them as possible. Every day I stayed in the program, the pressure to compromise mounted and mounted. And every single time that I resisted that pressure, they became more aggressive in demanding that I do compromise. My last official meeting before I left the program, I was told in no uncertain terms, we don't care how good your dissertation is. You ain't passing. We aren't going to allow you to graduate unless you do things our way. (laughs) They thought they had me over a barrel. 18 years of my life, nine doing a PhD, my work, my writing, my teaching, network, contacts. Who's going to give all that up for integrity, please? (laughs) I stood up and started to pack my bags. They said, whoa, no, 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 Randy, sit down. We can talk about this. I sat down. I looked them all in the eye and said, at 14, my family lost its farm. By 18, my family had fallen apart. My father and brother, who had always been very close with, sank into drugs and alcohol and never came out. 
My father had become extremely psychologically and emotionally abusive. Just in the past few years, both my father, brother, and my grandmother had passed away. There were points in my life where I had nothing, didn't know where my next meal was coming from. I've had various weapons of all types pulled and used on me. At one point, I was beaten so badly, I had to be carried into the hospital. I carry the scars and wounds to this day. I've been targeted by a criminal organization and corrupt officials, and you're going to threaten me? What can you do to me that's worse than what I've already gone through? You're going to tell me I can't have a piece of paper just because you don't like who I am? You all can go pound sand. I might have used a little spicier language when I told them what they could do to themselves. That's when I finished packing my bag and walked out. I've never been back. Yeah, I don't have the tenured professorship and all the perks that go along with that, but I still have me. We go back to values. Why was I in the PhD program to begin with? Because I believed I had something important to say that would be a valuable contribution to architecture. My nine plus years in the program taught me two important lessons. The first one, I do have something important to say that is of value to architecture. And two, there are people out there very interested in what I have to say. That little piece of paper that they were waving under my nose trying to threaten me with, it's irrelevant to what I'm trying to do. Yeah, it'd be nice to have, and in some respects would make things easier, but it also turns out that the very people who value that little piece of paper are the ones least interested in hearing what I have to say. And those who are interested, that little piece of paper is irrelevant. Rourke is right. The type of people that seek me out are my type of people. You think I have a strong personality? <laughs> you should see some of my friends. When I walked out that day, I wasn't making some grand gesture. I wasn't driven by ideology, agenda, or politics. I did it because I value me. No more, no less. My self-worth has more value than anything they can offer. When you're comfortable in what you believe, your value system, you're no longer distracted by the irrelevant, the noise. You move on. There's another thing that the movie gets right. I have it on good authority that there's a number of those professors to this day hate my guts. I live rent-free in their heads. Those who have given up their integrity, when they encounter somebody who doesn't, it can break them. Rourke's message is just as cogent today as it was in 1945. Online bullying, cancel culture, compelled speech, yada, yada, yada. If you know yourself, you know your values and your priorities, you will quickly realize most of the loudest voices are irrelevant. If you don't mind, they don't matter. If you stay true to yourself, more often than not, you'll come out the other side just fine. Things may not work out the way you originally planned. It doesn't matter. What does matter, though? You'll still have the thing that makes you, you. At any rate, I hope I've given you all something to think about. And until next time, you all be safe. If you all are still here, you're being true to yourself. No, no, just kidding. But thank you, though. While you're at it, why don't you like this video, subscribe to the channel, click that notification bell. You can hear me yammer on about something else next time. And feel free to share this video far and wide. Please like and subscribe. Please leave a comment.